Hi, I'm Samir and I'm a health coach and a PhD student based in Johannesburg, South Africa. And today I'm going to be looking at a video from Mick the Vegan on coconut oil. Um, actually, I think he pronounces it Mike the Vegan. Sorry about that, Mike. So uh, let's take a quick look at what he has to say. Short answer, coconut oil is over, but really there's more to it. All right, let's keep this brief, let's get going. In the past, I have referred to a few coconut oil studies, but they're really just single studies. And yeah, they did show things like coconut oil was pretty bad for LDL, but butter was worse, and that still stands today. But we didn't have a good, more rigorous study, so we have this systematic review and meta-analysis. So uh, absolutely, yes, looking at the meta-analysis is always gonna be better than just checking individual studies, 100% agreed. Well, vegetable oils, coconut oil raised LDL, that bad cholesterol, by a statistically significant 10 milligrams per deciliter, and the researchers go on to say, quote, Therefore, coconut oil should not be viewed as healthy oil for cardiovascular disease risk reduction and limiting coconut oil consumption because of its high saturated fat content is warranted. Okay, so here, right now, he's putting his conclusion at the front of his argument, which is good in a, in a YouTube video, in a short YouTube video, it's a good thing to do. But I have a problem with the conclusion because the conclusion assumes that there's a causal link between LDL levels and hard outcomes. So I don't actually care if I see someone's blood work, I don't actually care about their LDL per se. Um, you know, or if I'm looking at a study, I don't care about LDL levels. What I care about is, you know, who in the study died of a heart attack, who had a stroke, who was healthy, etc. So there's a hypothesis, there's a hidden hypothesis in a lot of this literature that LDL or high LDL is causally associated with risk of cardiovascular disease. And in my reading of the literature, I mean, that's complete nonsense. So in the studies that allegedly showed this originally, going back to the 1960s and even before that, so we have the Minnesota Diet Heart Experiment, we have the Sydney Diet Heart Trials. The scientists involved did not publish all of their data. They did not publish data showing that the um, low LDL, they were able to roll lower LDL, which is why everyone's on a statin now, but they did not publish the data showing that a lower LDL was not associated with better outcomes or was not significantly associated with better outcomes, right? Um, in previous videos, I've posted those links. Here's a slide from another trial that was done in Japan, 2002. Um, this trial, again, found no significant difference between the cholesterol-lowering group and the control group. Um, and this is the case in just about every anti-cholesterol uh, trial I've seen, right? So in some cases, there may be small, small differences in risk reduction. So they get around this by talking about the difference between relative risk and absolute risk. Um, so I've talked about this elsewhere, but let's go over it again. In most of these trials, the vast majority of people don't die. So when that's the case, so when you have like 99% of people in the control group don't die, and 98.3% of the people in the intervention group uh, don't die, so that's a difference of 1% versus 1.7%. 7%, right? Not statistically significant because these are thousands of people, so such a small uh, difference can't be picked up. But, it, but when you change that, so when you talk about relative risk, um, then you can change that from a difference between 1% and 1.7% or whatever it is, 1% and 2%. Um, you can change that to a difference of 400% or something ridiculous like that, right? So again, that's a difference in relative risk. So if your relative risk goes up from practically nothing, 0.3%, to a little bit higher, you know, 0.9%, for example, that's a difference of 300%. So this is a slide I got from David Diamond. The entire link to his video debunking some of the, the statin trials is down below. Um, I'd urge you to check it out. Talk, understanding the difference between relative and absolute risk is really important to understanding why a lot of medical literature is not what you think, does not say what you think it says. <laughs> That first quote, it raised HDL, that good cholesterol, by four points. Well, it did raise the bad cholesterol over twice as much, but you might be thinking, oh, so maybe it's worth it. It raises that good cholesterol, so I should keep eating it. The researchers clearly foresaw this train of thought and addressed the point with, quote, while coconut oil intake also increased HDL cholesterol concentrations, efforts to reduce cardiovascular disease risk by increasing HDL cholesterol have been unsuccessful. Okay, so this is 100% true, right? Drugs that increase HDL, so for a while it was noticed that people with higher HDL have better outcomes when it comes to heart disease. So they developed drugs that will increase the HDL, but that doesn't work. It doesn't seem to do anything, right? But in the, in the absence of drugs, the only numbers that I care about in a cholesterol panel, mostly, 
uh, with some small exceptions. But, but if the HDL is high and the triglycerides are low, that indicates to me that the person is in good metabolic health. Those, those, that's a really good indication. That does not, from that, it does not follow that taking coconut oil or whatever to raise your HDL is a good idea. It's, it's just an indicator, um, and it's probably signifying something else. Probably the HDL is not, in itself is not the important thing, but it's signifying something else which is important. Which again looked at five studies that had inflammation readings, actual inflammation studies, and bad news for coconut oil, they found no inflammation benefit. Okay, so I don't think coconut oil should be taken for anti-inflammatory anti properties. Like, I don't think it has anti-inflammatory properties. I don't think anyone thinks that. Maybe there are people who think that, but I, I'm, not, I'm not following that literature. Um, what I do think is the following. So, so the, 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 the question is, when you introduce anything to the diet, the question is, what are you replacing, right? So if we introduce coconut oil, and we take away canola oil, sunflower oil, these seed oils, which are known to be inflammatory, the net effect might be slightly anti-inflammatory, right? So you might have less inflammation replacing those highly inflammatory oils with coconut oil. doesn't mean the coconut oil is anti-inflammatory. It just means that what have you replaced when you made these changes to your diet? Sugar control or that it reduces adiposity or fat. I don't know why something that is literally pure fat, nine calories per gram would reduce fat. Okay, so here I have a randomized, double-blinded, interventional trial showing that coconut oil can indeed lead to less belly fat, less uh, abdominal obesity, especially in a population of healthy women. So this was done with uh, young women between the ages of 20 and 40, um, you know, and they introduced coconut oil and they found that it led to less um, adiposity, less obesity around the, the abdomen especially, which is what we're most concerned about. So um, it shouldn't be, that's not, one study doesn't prove anything but shouldn't be discounted. Um, and the fact that he goes straight to calories, so he talks about how much calories per ounce you have in, in coconut oil, tells me that he understands pretty much nothing about how fat tissue works, about how obesity works, about how fat acts as kind of part of the endocrine system, part of the hormonal system, and how different fatty acids can lead to different outcomes. So I don't know why we should listen to this guy. He doesn't seem to understand um, how fat works. And the few studies that showed any negative trend that it might lower LDL, well, those weren't statistically significant, but 10 of the studies showing that it increases LDL were statistically significant. And for a quick refresher, that confidence interval not touching the baseline value means that it was statistically significant. And then, of course, the combined result was statistically significant that it raised LDL. Okay, so it's important to understand here what he's talking about is statistical significance of an irrelevant outcome. Saturated fat, like coconut oil, and like, most importantly, dairy. Dairy is high in saturated fat. That raises LDL. Everyone's known that since the 1950s and the 1960s. Nobody disputes that. The question is, does that raised LDL lead to worse outcomes? And uh, none of the studies he's talking about here, I mean, it's a meta-analysis, so I, I can't see all the data in all of the individual studies, but the meta-analysis is not talking about outcomes. It's just talking about high, H high LDL. LDL. And the study also looked at palm oil, which no, is also not a health food for many reasons. It is actually reasonably high saturated fat. Coconut oil is 90% and palm oil is 50%. And even then the coconut oil raised LDL significantly more than palm oil. Okay, so here let's talk about the difference between fruit oils, so like palm oil, coconut oil, olive oil. So these are things that you can, you know, pretty easily ex extract oil from. Um, so from a health perspective, let's stick to a health perspective. I mean, I, I happen to avoid palm oil for other reasons. But from a health perspective, there is no evidence that fruit oils are bad for us. There are populations that have been using palm oil and coconut oil for thousands of years with no apparent issues. We have to imagine if you're taking somebody who's vegan here and then giving them coconut oil, that could be completely messing up their LDL cholesterol. And in so many cases, I've seen people be like, why is my cholesterol high on a vegan diet or not as low as I'd want it to be at least? And more often than not, not every time, but more often than not, it seems anecdotally to me, totally anecdotal, that it's because they have coconut oil in their diet. Again, does that matter? I mean, I would love to see those vegans or anyone who's worried about their cholesterol go and get their CAC scores, the coronary artery calcium scores, uh, or something like that, which is far more indicative of their risk, of their heart attack risk, right? So you could be like me and have practically a zero cal coronary calcium score, 
but very high cholesterol. Or you could be like other people who have very low cholesterol, but very dangerously high CAC scores, right? So, uh, you know, there's this assumption underlying this whole video that LDL is related to heart, uh, heart disease risk. And we certainly know that that's not the case. Even, even I think uh, Mike would have to accept that it's not the case in 100% of the cases. It, it may be one indicator, one relatively minor indicator, but there are many people with low LDL who have heart who get heart attacks, right? There are many people on statins who get heart attacks, right? So it's not a certainly not a guarantee, right? I am just a little amazed that people still can wrap their minds so easily around how refined sugar is not healthy, yet refined fats are somehow healthy. I don't know. So yes, a hundred percent refined oils are unhealthy, but how do you define a refined oil? I mean, like here's a video or of someone making coconut oil at home, right? In a, in a blender using uh, and boiling it down. That is refining. I don't want to say it's not refining, but it's different than the deodorizing, the high temperature pasteurizing, the coloring that needs to happen in order for, um, in order for something like canola oil to be edible. And that is a highly industrialized process. No one's making canola oil at home. And if you are, if you're making any kind of seed oil at home, it's going to go rancid very, very quickly, right? It needs to go through an industrial process in order to be edible, right? So, yeah, okay, refined oil, but not all refined oils are the same. At the end, what I want to talk about is really first principles, right? So there is a first principle I would posit, and I don't think Mike would disagree with me, that chronic disease is a relatively modern phenomenon. So it's come in the last 100, 150 years, right? And it's a Western phenomenon. So we look at di- we look at populations in China or in the Arctic or wherever. The, when they transition to a sort of standard Western diet, the rates of chronic disease go from practically zero to very very high, right? So that tells us that there's something in what we're eating recently, which is a problem, right? So when you try and find that in cholesterol, <laughs> when you try and find that in 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 coconut oil, when you try and find that in butter when you try and find that in ghee, I mean, you're attacking mediums that humans have been using and healthy human populations have been using for thousands of years. Whereas when we talk about high fructose corn syrup, right? When we talk about sugar, when we talk about refined oils, those are things that humans have only been using within that time frame, 100 to 150 to 200 years. And we know that um, the more that those oils became prevalent in the diet. In other words, when, when lard and ghee and butter were being taken out of Western diets in the 1970s and 1980s, we know that the problems actually got worse, right? Um, so you can, I mean, there's other things too. High fructose corn syrup was also going up at that time. So I, I can't pose a, a causal relationship between those seed oils and some of the, the bad outcomes because there are too many factors. Um, but coconut oil is not, not a factor, right? Coconut oil is, is a distraction. The co- populations that eat coconut oil, a lot of coconut oil, in South India, in Southeast Asia, and elsewhere, tend to be, by and large, very healthy populations, especially when those populations are not taking refined grains, you know, Coca-Cola, high fructose corn syrup, etc. So when the populations are, are non-urban populations when they're living away from, um, from access to refined grains, refined seed oils, and so on, they tend to be very healthy. Um, so from, from this, it just follows, like there's lots of literature we could get into on, on coconut oil and, and risks and benefits and so on. But just at the level of first principles, it seems pretty clear to me that whatever the problem is in our diet, it's not coconut oil. So eat your coconut oil, eat your lard, eat your beef tallow, eat your ghee, eat your butter. Um, but worry about foods that have been introduced in the last 100 or 200 years, which include high fructose corn syrup, which include uh, your refined seed oils, yeah, and refu- include all kinds of refined sugars. Like if you focus on those um, as opposed to traditional foods, I think you're going to do much better. So with that, I'm Samir, your health coach and PhD student in Johannesburg. Thanks so much for watching.